All right, so let's go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, good afternoon. My name is Maya Srinivasan, and I'll be your uh, host this afternoon. Uh, and we're pleased to welcome Bill Miller, who's going to share um, his expert opinions and um, information on the science of coffee. So Bill earned his, uh, oh, I should introduce myself first, sorry. I'm the program coordinator for the construction program at PGCC. And when I'm not, you know, teaching and doing all the stuff that my job requires me to do, I really like to cook. And one of my favorite things is to, you know, become a better cook through science as well. So um, I'm a big fan of tinkering in the kitchen to get uh, better results through science. And so I'm very excited to um, help moderate this session. Um, about our presenter today, Bill Miller earned his BS in chemical engineering at the University of Delaware in 1993, and his PhD in chemical engineering at the University of California in Davis in 2001. He grew up in Maryland and then lived in California from 1993 to 2019 while he got his PhD and taught chemistry at Sacramento City College. He currently teaches chemistry at PGCC and leads a small undergraduate research group working on developing educational materials for chemistry labs. And one of his favorite quotes to students is, chemistry is hard enough when you get all your questions answered. It's much harder when you don't. So hopefully audience, you're going to um, take that as an invitation to ask lots of questions and Bill's gonna be happy to answer them for you. So with that, take it away, Bill. Thank you, Maya, and thank you everybody else for being here. Um, I do, and I do, uh, as uh, some of my students who I see in the audience uh, know, uh, uh, hopefully you have this experience. I do uh, encourage questions, although what I like to do is have those questions come at the end. So please write them down or make a note, um, uh, which is different than my class, I know, but we'll, we'll keep questions to the end. Well, uh, just as a little bit more background about me, uh, uh, as a chemist, uh, I went to a conference in 2013 and uh, one of my colleagues there said, it's, it's really pretty easy to roast your own coffee and it's so delicious. And so I've been roasting coffee since 2013. Um, I've even taught a class called the science of coffee at my former school. And uh, when I started making this presentation, it was almost entirely going to be about uh, the second part of my outline that I'm showing here using science to make the most enjoyable cup of coffee. But I was reading the newspaper and I kept seeing different uh, health effects of coffee studies coming up. And I really was interested in finding out what they mean. Like, cause you, it's one thing to read an article in the newspaper. It's another thing entirely to read the actual article itself and see what it means. And uh, we're going to make some inroads uh, into um, understanding, hopefully, how to read uh, not only newspaper articles, but also primary sources, journal articles. And we won't get all the way there, and I, I certainly am not all the way there myself, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll learn a little bit about um, the health effects of coffee as well. Uh, let me see here. There we go. And so... Um, uh, I was reading the New York Times on February 18th, and I saw this article, Coffee Drinking Tied to Lower Risk of Heart Failure. And as a coffee drinker myself, I said, great, I don't want heart failure. Uh, but, um, but what, you know, what, is it true? You know, we, we, we read things and then we should be skeptical. We're scientists, we're STEM majors, we're STEM, um, uh, in the STEM field. So uh, I started here and then I did a search in the New York Times and sure enough, the previous month, there was another article. And then sure enough, if I looked from 2019 and 2020, this is just in the New York Times, there were three other articles. And I was thought, hmm, there's a lot of things to think about here. And wouldn't it be great if I and we could all be educated readers and learn more about what all these things mean? especially because a lot of the information is contradictory. Um, it'll say one month or one year drinking coffee is good. And then the next year drinking coffee is bad. And then what, you know, anyway. So that's sort of the background for my presentation. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, go back to this February 18th article in the New York Times and really do a, a, a pretty close reading on it. 
And so it says coffee drinking tied to lower risk of heart failure. And the first thing I notice is that word tied, right? What does it mean? Does it mean that if I drink more coffee, I will have a lower risk of heart failure? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and you know, it's, uh, uh, then it talks about uh, being an innovative study that looked at hundreds of factors. Anyway, there's a lot to read here. And what I'd like to do is go through a couple pieces of this and then actually go to the primary source article. So uh, one of the paragraphs I've got right here, it says the analysis included extensive decades long data from three large health studies, blah, blah, blah. What does this all mean? Well, uh, when I read it more closely, it means that these are observational or anecdotal studies, these large health studies, and they have lots of participants, but the participants, as I read it, they, even though they were tested and provided lifestyle and medical history information, this is what's called an observational or anecdotal study. So the first thing we have to know about this study is that it can prove correlation, meaning two things happened at the same time, but not causation. One did not cause the other. So, and that's important because when you get something like a vaccine, you want causation. You want the vaccine to inhibit or stop something from happening to you. You don't want the, anyway, so there's a big difference there. And the first thing we wanna say about this study and almost all studies I've read involving coffee is that there's correlation. So uh, you can't say, if I drink coffee, these things will or will not happen. You can just say, somebody drank coffee and this is what happened to them. Next, um, what are the results from this article? It says drinking a cup a day or less of coffee had no effect, but two cups a day conferred, well, well, we'll talk more about that, but that word and what it means, conferred a 31% reduced risk and three cups or more reduced risk by 29%. And then it says more and say, again, so where we are right now, and we'll amend this later in the presentation, but uh, since this is observational, we can say people who drink two to three cups of coffee also have a lower risk of heart failure, okay? And I don't know about you, I'm a one cup of coffee a day drinker, especially right now with everything going on with the pandemic. If I were to drink two or three or more cups of coffee per day, and this is just personally, I would be a nervous wreck. And so I, you know, and which I know is not good for me from everything I read about stress. So I am not gonna go out and drink three cups a day just to lower my risk of heart failure because of course health is a complex issue. But anyway, we're, we're sort of starting to analyze this. Then, okay, so can I read the actual article? Well, sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. Sometimes they're behind what are called paywalls, which also you have to pay to get the New York Times actually. But in this one, it says the analysis is in uh, this circulation heart failure journal and it provides a link which you can follow. And so you can actually go back to the primary source which is awesome. And that's what we're gonna do next. Um, there's also some other stuff here about the 204 variables and the 41 strongest factors. Um, but the bulk of this uh, issue, the bulk of this article will be just about the coffee part. And so there'll be actually a lot of data to look at, but we'll mostly focus on the coffee part. All right, so that's sort of the New York Times article. Let's go back. We looked up and you can Google it or you can follow the link in the New York Times. Uh, the article is called Association Between Coffee Intake and Incident Heart Failure Risk, a Machine Learning Analysis of the FHS, the ERIC Study, and the CHS. And we'll say more about what these studies are. And we won't actually talk anything about the machine learning analysis. In my personal opinion, I don't think it added very much to this study. Um, and so, but of course, whenever you're reading things, mostly you get more questions than your questions are answered, which being in the STEM fields as we all are, 
is just a part of life, right? You read something, it raises so many more questions. Hopefully it answers at least a few. And that's what our hope is today. All right. So uh, you open up the article and there's a bunch of very technical words and big tables worth of data like this. Um, and uh, the first thing I would suggest is, all right, take a deep breath. We are gonna get through reading some of this and it's okay to focus on small parts and understanding small parts at a time. I can tell you, I've read this article and looked at this table and uh, the next page, the next table for days at this point. And I still don't understand it all. Take it piecemeal, say, ask one question and see if you can answer it and go from there. And eventually it all comes into place or enough of it. And again, I don't plan on reading this, you know, the full amount of time that it would take to understand everything about this, but I've made some, some strides and that's what I'm sharing with you today. Okay. Anyway, so we have lots of data. We have lots of technical terms. Let's break this down into tiny chunks and see how we do. All right. So first we'll ask the question, how was the study conducted? We've seen from the New York Times article that it involved uh, 21,000 participants. Um, and, uh, but okay, it, it actually mentions which studies there are. So in the title, it mentioned FHS, uh, the Framingham Heart Study, uh, which collected thousands of pieces of data, uh, including asking people about the, um, their health habits and their eating habits. And it turns out that um, when it started in 1948, they didn't ask about coffee. It wasn't until their 14th meeting with the participants that they started asking about coffee. And so the age of the participants that were, stu that were studied in this article is actually quite advanced, 55 to 88 years old with an average age of 66. So that's one thing to note. Not only this is how was, it, uh, how was the study conducted, but who were the people in the study? And you look at the cardiovascular health study, CHS, um, it was started significantly later, but it also, an average age of 71 years when, when they looked at the data for this uh, research article. And you start to see that, well, this is not, so uh, I'm turning 50 this year and I would be young for the uh, information in this study. So maybe this applies to you, maybe this doesn't. I don't know, but it's something to think about. And the third study is the ERIC study, uh, arteriosclerosis risk in communities. And anyway, but, but you work with the data you have. I understand why these researchers did it. Um, it's a great idea. We just have to be aware of what the limitations on the study are. Okay, so that's sort of, these are all correlational studies, observational studies for this, uh, for this paper, this article. And what's going to start coming up is some terms. And one of the terms that came up immediately in this article was p-value. And I'm not going to go into deep detail about p-value, but I've gone into, my understanding I think is decent. And probably in the audience, there are people who know more about p-values than I do. But a working definition, right? On my backgrounds in engineering, I love working definitions of things. The p-value is the probability that two values are statistically the same. And if P is less than 0.05, here, that's right, I have a pointer here, uh, then there is a less than 5% probability that the two numbers are the same, okay? So, and P less than 0.05 is often used as sort of the standard to say, this is a real effect. So we're gonna be looking at P values and in particular, P values less than 0.05, probability values, you could say, then there's less than 5% that probability that two numbers are the same. And in fact, that's another way of saying statistically the two numbers are different. Well, and uh, I wanted to work through a p-value example to give you a taste for it. And this is a totally made up example, but I put PGCC in it. It says in a national poll, university students sleep 7.02 hours per night in a poll of 202 students conducted at PGCC, students reported uh, sleeping 6.90 hours, plus or minus 0.84 hours. And then the question is, is there less than a 5% chance with this p-value that these numbers are the same? 
And if you look at these two numbers and their standard deviations plotted here, they're very close to each other. But when you have a population of 200 or a large number of students, you get to use, instead of the standard deviation, you get to use something called the standard error. And this is number Z that we're gonna calculate is going to end up being the number of standard errors from the national average. So even though these two numbers are very close to each other and their uh, standard deviations overlap, there's a way to tell that even if these two numbers are statistically different. All right, and then I've defined my standard error. It's the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of data points. So divided by the square root of 202 here. Um, Anyway, so uh, uh, we'll go on. Um, same question. Here's our calculation for Z that says we are 2.03 standard errors from the average. And the negative sign just means since it's 6.9, it's lower than the number. So we're less than two standard errors away. And here's the source for this example that I'm using, by the way. And then you go to a Z versus P table. And I know these are, these, it's starting to sound like a chemistry or a physics problem, I know, but there's a process and steps. But you look up minus 2.03 and you look where the numbers cross and you get your P value. And our P value is 0 0.0212, which means that since P is less than 0.05, these numbers have a less than 5% chance of being the same. And therefore, the students at PGCC do get less sleep than the national average of university students. So uh, that's a little introduction to P and how it works, because we're going to see some p-values. And we're going to want our p-value to be less than 0 0.05 to really make solid conclusions. All right, now the next thing that comes up a lot in these studies is the hazard ratio, HR. And a working definition of the hazard ratio is the probability, is the ratio of the probability of events in a treatment group compared to the probability of events in a control group. And I'll just say right here, to truly calculate the hazard ratio, you need crazy statistics. I have not even gone anywhere near that but I have found a useful approximation and let's get into that, okay? So it says to get a rough idea of the hazard ratio, you look at the percent of events for a treatment group and our treatment group this time that we're gonna eventually talk about is people who drink coffee. And then you're gonna look at percent of events for the control group and that's gonna be people who do not drink coffee. And so for example, if you have some subjects and uh, there's a certain number get heart failure over a 10 year period and you calculate the percent, that's gonna be the percent that goes in the bottom down here. And then for another group of subjects, you get a different percent that get heart failure. That's the treatment group that goes on the top. And the hazard ratio that we approximate, and again, this is, a, this is a total approximation. There's much more to this, but we get relatively good numbers using a simple approach, which since I'm an engineer, I love simple approaches that get me decent numbers. So the hazard ratio is 0 0.93 for this, and that is equal to a 7% reduction. So think of one as the standard hazard. So a 7% or 0 0.07 uh, difference in the risk of getting heart failure during the 10 year period. So, and again, our numbers won't be exact, but we'll use numbers from those big tables that I showed to actually get an idea of hazard ratios. All right, so now finally, let's get back to the uh, journal article. It says, what are the results? And uh, it says, this is heart failure risk reduction for coffee drinkers using data from the three large studies. And again, I've got the average age of the participants here because we want to keep that in mind. I've got my p-values here, and you'll note that they're all less than uh, 0 0.05. So these are gonna be a uh, good chance. These are good numbers, Hi high probability that these are good numbers. And I've got the hazard ratios from the paper. 
and the risk reduction. And so uh, 5, 13, and 2% are what they found for people of these average ages and their uh, lowered risk or their risk reduction of getting heart failure. And you might say, well, 2%, 5%, 13%. Well, you know, the, the, this, this, this table at, at, you know, I look at this and I get more questions than I had before. One of them is, um, okay, if you look at the risk as a function of the age, it seems like if you're 71, you know, the older you are as a coffee drinker, the more risk reduction you have. And what does that even mean? But anyway, so, so this, this is, these are numbers directly out of the study. And, um, but we haven't seen that 30% yet, right? The, the original New York Times article said 30%. So, and, and we're getting there, but just as a whole, um, just if you drink coffee, right? That 30% came with drinking a certain amount of coffee as a subset of this. Anyway, so, but, but yes, there is a correlation and our conclusion here, I think is a good one. Well, let's keep going. There's a lot of numbers we can look at here. And these are more numbers from the study. And I pulled them out and put them here and we'll go back to those big tables in a minute. But the study based on just the CHS data, which is one of the three studies, said that if you drink one, two or three cups, you get, uh, well, all right, here's our 30% reduction in risk. If you drink two or three cups of coffee and the associated hazard ratios, right? So 0.69 and 0.31 add up to one. So yes, uh, everything's working there. And you can see that the p-values are very small, much less than 0 0.05. These are good numbers, is what the article is saying, and, and I believe them. While being skeptical, they have offered good evidence that this is true. But then they don't say anything about one cup of coffee, and that's because the p-value was 0.19 for that set of data. So that means that there's a 19% chance that there's no difference be between the heart failure risk of drinking one cup of coffee versus zero, okay? So they don't say anything about this. If they did, you can calculate the hazard ratio from their paper and it actually would say that the hazard, the, your, your risk goes up. <laughs> so they're not, so there's no information here in this first row. There is information here and we can make a conclusion that says, again, looking at who was tested, that there's a correlational relationship between people who drink two and three cups of coffee and lowered risk of heart failure. Okay, that's, that's useful. That's, that's what this article was saying. Way back in the beginning, remember it said that coffee drinking was tied to, so correlational. Okay, well, um, here's back to the tables. And this is actually the second table I showed before for cups of coffee per day. And we have all these variables. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually focus on this bottom part of this table and look at the HF is heart failure. Um, and we're gonna look at these statistics right here and I'm gonna call them out in the next slide. There we go. And so this is that bottom of that last table and we're ignoring the one cup per day data because we found that there was no correlate, no useful p-values there, there's nothing that says that drinking one cup a day has any difference in getting heart failure than zero cups per day. But there was something that said two and three cups. And so these numbers that I've circled are the percent of participants who got heart failure. And the numbers don't, are, are important actually for the specific analysis, but in our analysis, remember, we're just going to approximate the hazard ratio using the percentages of people that got these. So for two cups a day versus zero cups a day, it's 15% versus 23%. We get a hazard ratio in this approximation of 0.65. And that's not too far off of what they found from their crazy statistics or you know their accurate approach, they might call it, um, of 0.69. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is a typo. This is the three cups a day 
using the 17 over here. I apologize for that. And you get 0 0.74, which again is not that different than their reported 0 0.71. And what I would suggest from here is that we have a simple, relatively good method of looking at numbers in a paper and getting hazard ratios, which is a powerful thing to do. Hazard ratios and P numbers show up in almost all of these studies. So having some tools to deal with them simply, I mean, that's, that's what we're all about, right? Um, so anyway, so yes, so we agree. We can, and we can generally verify this in a simple way. Um, all right. But we can also now look at the other numbers in this table. And I'm not sure why they didn't do this in this paper, but you can look at the uh, risk of stroke as a function of cups of coffee per day. And you find, so again, no reported value in the paper. I don't know why. And again, this should be three cups of coffee down here. I apologize. Um, but you can see that there's a significant reduction, significant lowering of the hazard ratio which means a significant lowering of risk of getting stroke for this correlational study if you drink two or three cups of coffee a day and if you're in your 50 to 70 year old range, right? These are all the things, in, and maybe this applies to 20 year olds and maybe it doesn't. We can't say that right now. Anyway, but you can also do uh, coronary heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, you can look at the numbers here and get some simple approaches to, um, to hazard ra uh, ratios and reduction in risk. Um, anyway, and so like all good studies, I think it raises just as many questions as it answers. It does a good job of answering questions, and we've at least got two new tools to use in our tool bag to think about these uh, articles. And here's a couple um, of different uh, sources for how to read a scientific paper. So these were some of the things I referenced as I was putting this together. And uh, this is a nice quote, be skeptical, but when you get proof, accept proof. And I like that. And so we have, they, they've done a nice job in this article of providing some proof. Um, and they've, uh, for me, they've raised a number of other questions. Phew, that was a lot to get through and reading uh, scientific papers is uh, something that a nice big cup of coffee can often help you get through, especially if you're doing it late at night. So I'm gonna switch gears here and talk for a few minutes about using science to scientifically make the most enjoyable cup of coffee. And like any science, uh, we're gonna look at four, um, we're gonna look at different variables and we're gonna alter one variable at a time and look at the effect on the taste of the coffee, right? Good, so that's a, that's a very effective way in general to do science, control everything except one thing, then you can see the effect of that one thing. And we're also gonna talk about uh, these four are in my humble opinion, the most important variables that you can control to make the best cup of coffee. Now, um, the roast is the first one. And uh, just to give you an idea about the different roasts, light roast beans smell great. They have the most caffeine, but they tend to have smaller amounts of coffee taste. They also have the lowest pH, which means they're the most acidic. And that's because they have the most acids in them. Um, and they, uh, but then dark roast beans, have the least caffeine and have a mix of taste that includes a roasted or burnt taste that a lot of people I have found out over the years identify with how coffee should taste. And that's great. Uh, they have the highest pH, in the, which means the lowest acidity, although they're still acidic. And that's because the acids in the beans have burned off or reacted away. There's some chemistry in there, I'm happy to say. Um, and then there's medium roast beans, which tend to have the most developed coffee flavor without tasting too roasted, and of course have an intermediate pH. And I'm a big fan of medium roast beans personally, but what I'm a most a big fan of is everybody having the cup of coffee that they love the most. For example, my wife, her favorite is dark roast. 
And since I roast my own beans, I roast her dark roast, then I roast me medium roast, and we're both happy in the morning when we have our coffee together. Um, all right, and so uh, I do roast them, and uh, you can roast them with a hot air popcorn popper, which I don't know if you've got my picture up, but there is my popcorn popper, and I roasted some this morning. Um, you can buy uh, a pound of green unroasted coffee beans, and you can control the roast yourself, right? We're doing this scientifically. You can roast your own beans. This popper, by the way, costs 20 bucks if you go to sweetmarias.net and it comes with a few pounds of coffee beans for that. It is a screaming deal, by the way. Um, and what's special about this one is that it swirls the beans in the popper. Most popcorn poppers these days blow the hot air straight up. And when it does that, the, um, they tend to cause fires. So don't try this with just any popcorn popper. Make sure you get this exact one if you're gonna try this at home. And what I've got here is I did roast some beans. I actually roasted these this morning. Um, here's what some green beans look like in a little cup. And this is 75 grams of green beans. Uh, so about two to three, ounce, three ounces, I think. And then over here, post roast, you can see the volume change in the beans, same glass. They actually expand and they pop like popcorn does, which is pretty awesome. And then they actually lose about 10% um, of their mass because you're doing chemical reactions as you roast. And now let's see if I can get this. This center one is a 30 second video of the roasting process. Let me go ahead and start it. And you can see them starting up. I just jumped ahead. You can see them spinning and getting darker. I'm just gonna jump ahead in a minute. And you can see that they're roasted. And this entire process, the entire roasting process inside this popcorn popper took six minutes. And you can only make enough for a few cups in here. Um, but it's enough to uh, make coffee for uh, a day, so which is perfect because then you can make it and enjoy it uh, either the same day or the next day. Um, okay, says and so then that was the first variable is roast. There's also brew method, so uh, you can look at different brew methods and see uh, which one you like. Um, and all of these have very different tastes, by the way. Uh, especially the French press with a metal filter versus what uh, something called the Clever Dripper, which you can Google. Clever Dripper is my favorite, by the way. I've got one right here. Um, and then the Mr. Coffee Machine is oftentimes what I use when I'm in a hurry because it's good coffee, especially if you use a fresh roast. Um, uh, and it's quick and easy to use. Grind size is also important. Uh, we have extra fine espresso all the way down on one end. All the way over here, we've got coarse. And for me, I think a nice medium is what I would use in a Mr. Coffee machine or uh, in pretty coarse for a, a French press. And you can Google all these things, but grind size is an important variable that you can control as well. Finally, contact time. So you can imagine an experiment where you use the same beans, the same roast, the same brew, method and the same grind, and then you vary the brew time. And you can see here, I've taken this from uh, royalcoffee.com, uh, looking at total dissolved solids versus brew time. And what you can see is the total dissolved solids, which we can say is the amount of coffee taste, increases with time, although you can start to see it leveling off at longer times. And um, so this is equivalent to uh, as you increase the amount of time, you get stronger coffee. So you can look at weaker coffee. Some people like it a little weaker. Some people like it a little stronger. Some people like it thick as mud, as they say. And again, these are all variables that you can control in um, making your own cup of coffee and varying one thing at a time you can think about. And you don't have to do these in any sort of order. Or if you only have one coffee machine, you can... Um, 
anyway, there's there's lots of science, lots of STEM education that can occur just by using coffee. Well, in summary, I'd like to propose that we've learned a few things today. Uh, first, we've learned about the p-value and the hazard ratio, and that these are two important statistical techniques that help us understand scientific studies of the health effects of coffee. Second, most studies, uh, and I don't know, I'm imagining all studies are correlational, but I didn't want to say that. Uh, all of the ones I've read, and certainly most studies on coffee, are correlational and not causational. All of the studies you read about the health effects of coffee are coincidentally people who drink coffee and what happens to them. The coffee, we cannot say it causes certain things, although I'd be very much interested if people did that. Third, um, I presented an experimental method to optimize your cup of coffee in the morning. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd also like to thank uh, the STEM Week team, uh, Yuda, Naharika, Calvin, Michelle, and Paul. Thank you very much for allowing me to give this presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Bill. That was uh, great. I uh, really liked all the way the way you uh, broke down that study. Um, I I had bookmarked it to read later on and never got around to it, so that was great. Um, just before we jump into the Q and A, um, I'd like to remind our audience that I did post a link to our survey and anyone who takes the survey automatically gets entered in a drawing for a gift card. So don't miss out on your chance and definitely help us make STEM week better by taking the survey. So at this point, I'd like to invite the audience to um, raise their hand if they have questions or you can also post questions in the chat and I'm happy to read them out. We did have one that came in already, which um, I'm going to read out right now. And in the meantime, if the others can, um, you can, as I said, you can raise your hand to ask a question. Um, and then when I invite you, you just unmute and speak, or else you can feel free to put them in the chat. So the first question we got was <clears throat> from Christine Woodring. How does it increase, sorry, decrease risk of, risk of heart failure if coffee increases your heart rate? What would that do to someone's heart over time? Yeah, no, so uh, that's a great question. And um, unfortunately, we can't, this, this study cannot answer it. Um, I, more broadly speaking, uh, as I, I mentioned before, yeah, no, so if I drink two, three, or four cups of coffee, uh, I'm going to be nervous and stressed out and my maybe and have heart palpitations. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's a great question. I wish I could answer it. Um, and, uh, but I don't know that that's, you know, one of the things I had a question about when I read this and some of the other studies is, well, maybe if you're still drinking two or three cups of coffee, when you're 71 years old, you're just not susceptible to heart palpitations or increased as susceptible as, uh, to, uh, increased heart rate as, as me or you or somebody else, like. I, you know, I, this, you, you have to, there's no way of knowing who, you know, specifically these people are that are being studied. So I think it's a great question. I wish I could answer it. Um, you know, and I think, you know, if I think about where these studies are really going, I think they're trying to say that at least we can say drinking coffee isn't going to kill you. <laughs> So it's okay, like it's like some things, like if, you know, alcohol. Too much alcohol over time, generally we know that's going to lead to uh, liver failure, right? Um, I think it's liver failure. Yeah, I think so. Um, so we, you, and for a while, actually, one of the first studies that came out, uh, I was reading about this too in researching this, said that there was a pretty strong correlation, still a correlation, between uh, lung cancer and drinking coffee. And it turned out that that was that the correlation was really that a lot of people who drank coffee or a predominance anyway, also smoked at one time. And it was really smoking that led to the lung cancer. Of course, we know that now. But at the time, if you just look, if you just looked at people who drink coffee, and people who get lung cancer, 
you there was a correlation, but there was another variable there that needed to be taken into account. So anyway, great question. I've I can't answer it, but that's that's sort of my thoughts on it anyway. All right, our next question is uh, to do with civet coffee. So you've probably heard of the uh, coffee that coffee cherries that are collected um, as part of the excre excreta of a kind of civet. And I was hoping you could um, break down for us the difference in processing that undergoes when it um, goes through an animal's system versus the processing method that is um, currently applied to coffee. Yeah, uh, good question. I, I can say a couple things about this. Uh, I don't know it in detail. Um, actually, I, I think there's some interesting studies to do there as far as uh, biological studies for things that happen uh, through the digestion process. Um, but I have had the civet coffee and the civet coffee has a, um, a uh, it's generally said it's pretty smooth and not bitter. So it's thought that the digestive process uh, strips some of the bitter components out of the coffee beans before they can be roasted. Um, I know uh, from uh, a little bit of study that I've done, there are a variety of methods of processing the beans to get them to you because uh, a, a coffee bean is really uh, more a fruit than anything else. So you start with a, a, a what are called coffee cherries and then you strip everything off of those and the coffee bean is actually the seed as far as I know. And so um, there's different techniques to get the materials out, um, sort of to, to rub off and there's wet processing and dry processing. Um, there's a number of different ways to treat them. But, I, but what's special about the civet method is that, um, I mean, I would say two things. One is, so it being, it has, actually has the opportunity to, um, trying to think of the right word here, but, but sort of suck out things from the beans that most of the other coffee processing ways don't. The, the, most of them are pretty much rinse them in water, which I guess could bring out a little bit, um, but then, but that's mechanical. You're pushing, you're, you're stripping the material off of the bean for the most part. Um, so, uh, and the other thing that Civic Coffee has I think is it's a true novelty. It's very rare. Um, you know, I think I heard about it first in a movie that I saw and, uh, and so it's very expensive. Um, you know, was it, I would say, I think most people, if you go to a coffee shop now can get equally good coffee at the coffee shop. Um, if they, you know, as they follow these different steps sort of that I went through, um, compared to even civic coffee. So I would love to try it again. Um, maybe I'll put that on my Hanukkah list this year as a little bit of civic, uh, civic coffee. Give it another try. Next question. You said that 10% of the coffee bean mass is lost during roasting. What then causes it to expand? Oh yeah, no. So um, yeah, no, that because I, I just roasted these this morning, so I've still got the beans right here. Um, so uh, there are, so it's it's actually a lot like popcorn. Um, so in popcorn, there's air pockets that when you heat up the air, right? This is straight out of general chemistry. When you heat up that air in those little pockets, it expands and it pushes against the bean or the popcorn, the piece of corn, until it pops. And so it is literally popping. And with the loudness of the um, popcorn popper, it's a little hard to hear, but I could hear it as I was doing it right here. It actually, you hear a little like pop, 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 pop as it goes. And it doesn't like popcorn turns itself inside out. These just grow by about 10 or 20% in size. And you could probably calculate it. I'd be interested, I should think about this. So PV equals NRT, the ideal gas law. So if you know the expansion in the volume, you can imagine maybe what pressures are building up in, pot, in the coffee beans to make it happen. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's why they, the volume increases is because you're popping these little, or you're basically popping or expanding these little air sacs inside the beans. 
All right. Um, the next question is, uh, does not, I mean, wouldn't three to four cups of coffee a day affect our blood sugar? Good question. So um, if you drink uh, coffee with no sugar in it, so uh, coffee actually itself, black coffee has uh, almost no calories. Um, and so I guess if you, you it, and really uh, I'll go back to this little plot here. So if you look at even strong coffee is only about 1.2 or 1.4% coffee solids. So even strong coffee is 98 plus percent water until you put in the sugar and the cream. And if you make it into a Frappuccino, I'm sure you could add another four or 500 calories there per uh, coffee. Um, but coffee itself, actually very low calorie. And um, I mean, if anything, it's gonna, you know, it's basically like drinking water. And, you know, one of the questions I've gotten before is about uh, coffee and hydration. And some of the reading I've done says that while caffeine is the diuretic, which does tend uh, to uh, dehydrate you, the overall effect is that drinking coffee does hydrate you overall. So anyway, that's an interesting fact too, I think. And I don't know if I answered the question, but um, it shouldn't, I mean, if, it depends on how much sugar, like just like soda. I mean, the more the soda uh, typically has a lot of sugar in it. And yes, that will be a problem. Coffee with a lot of sugar will be the same thing, but coffee itself, you'll be fine. Okay, uh, we have a comment with a question from uh, someone who says, I drink coffee only when I wanna have a good night's sleep. So how does that work? I thought caffeine is you know, meant to keep you alert and awake. That's a good question. Um, and I, so I have some comments. I, again, I'm, I'm not super knowledgeable about this, but a couple of things I've read. Um, one is that in, I think about 10% of the population, coffee, so because of the genetics, and again, this is not my area of expertise, but I've read that there are some people that put it, drinking coffee can put them to sleep depending upon how they metabolize it. Um, that's not me for sure. <laughs> uh, I have to drink, stop drinking coffee by noon or I do stay up at night. Um, and then the other thing is I just read this, which is really cool. So um, there's an article again in the New York Times that said, uh, if you want a power nap, you should drink your coffee, lay down for 30 minutes max, and when you wake up, basically the caffeine will hit your bloodstream and you're good to go. But like you can drink coffee and just by the, you know, the, what I've read is that, and somebody may know more about this than me, that in order to get into your stomach and processed, it does take about 30 minutes. And so uh, the recommendation was if you want to increase your productivity, take a nap or sorry, drink a cup of coffee lie down for 30 minutes, max 20 to 30 minutes in average, and then get up and you should, your body will feel rested and then the caffeine and the coffee will kick in and you can be more productive. And of course I should say, typically don't do that too late in the day because it will affect your sleep at night again for most people. But no, so there, are, so there are people who can drink coffee, uh, caffeinated coffee at bedtime. Uh, one of my old roommates actually could do that. And, uh, uh, for me, though, decaf uh, anything afternoon. Yeah, my husband does the the the, caf the the caffeinated coffee before a nap. He swears that it works, and but the person who asked the question clarified that uh, he or she did decaf. So I uh, don't know if you have any follow up observations to make on why that would help him or her sleep better. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, so what I know about decaf is to be declared decaf, you have to be 97% caffeine free or more. But and so there is some caffeine in decaf coffee. Um, so I don't know what the effect that has. But in but I in general, I can drink decaf coffee, you know, 8pm at night, um, uh, sometime while my wife and I are watching uh, Netflix at night, and uh, be able to sleep just fine. So it doesn't have very much coffee, or sorry, much caffeine. So I think it, it shouldn't necessarily affect um, 
especially if you're pretty tired. Would you say it might be the sort of soporific effect of a warm beverage, like kind of like your warm cup of milk? Uh, Maya, that's very possible. Good observation. Thank you. All right. And we have another question from Tina who says, when I drink coffee, I can't sleep. What is the cause of that? Yeah, no. So I, I think, uh, and this, uh, Tina, I have the same thing, which is, uh, I think it's just the caffeine. The caffeine, uh, and again, somebody may know more about this uh, in the audience than me, but uh, my understanding is that it takes three to seven hours to really metabolize the caffeine. So it's in your body for several hours. Um, and, and I know for me, um, it, it, yeah, again, I can't drink coffee after noon. So uh, at 10 p.m. at night, um, you know, it can still affect my sleep, even if I drink it, um, up, you know, if I, even if I drink it at 2 or 3 p.m. So no, it's, uh, my understanding is it's totally the effect of the caffeine for those who, who it affects them, them that way. Again, not everybody can, is affected that way, but the vast majority are, as far as I know. And we have another observation uh, that coffee makes uh, his heart beat fast. And why is that? You know, uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't know very much about the connection. I, so I do experience this too, um, but it, it must stimulate uh, some receptors. But yeah, I, I'm... Unfortunately, I, there's not much I can say, not much that I know about this other than, uh, yes, I have experienced this. <laughs> can you explain the phenomenon of uh, crema on top of an espresso, a cup of espresso? What makes that uh, foam so stable? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, yeah, and uh, espresso in general is, so um, actually is a pretty concentrated version of coffee. Uh, you can imagine that if you use, or from a chemical sense, if you use steam, which is in the gas phase as an extraction instead of water, which is how typical brews are done. Um, and I think, I'm trying to think, I think when I did uh, some tests on total dissolved solids of espresso, uh, it was up around 10 or 12 percent. So the extraction technique is just different. And I imagine because you're working with a gas that, and because there are um, surface active agents, uh, sort of like lipids in the coffee, that they can make foams. Um, I don't, I'm not, so don't, don't quote me on that. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but the, it's you're using a gas phase and gases can you know create bubbles basically is is my guess um, one of the techniques I show no I didn't show it there's this other technique to make drip coffee called an aeropress and then if you use an aeropress you actually force air and liquid through the coffee and you can get some crema like foam using that technique as well so that's my best guess is that you're involving the gas phase and gases can make bubbles. Uh, we have a few more minutes for questions in case anyone um, else wants to ponder those. Oh, does a cup, cup of coffee have more caffeine than a bottle of soda? I'm assuming this is a question from Anthony. I'm assuming the question is about something like cola which has caffeine, not all sodas are caffeinated, right? Right, yeah, no, so uh, again, I'm gonna reach back into my mind here, so don't 100% quote me on this, but uh, I think the typical cup of coffee has about 80 milligrams, and I'm sure this is easy to Google, um, milligrams of caffeine, and I thought I remembered that a, a 12 ounce can of Coke had about 50 milligrams of caffeine, I could be wrong on that. Like they're, they're actually not that different, but, um, uh, and coffee of course varies widely. I mean, depending upon the roast, depending upon uh, how strong it is. Um, so again, I, I would just say Google it. Um, there are, there, I'm sure there are pretty uh, easy to find numbers on that. Um, but, but they're in the same order of magnitude. Us as STEM educators uh, uh, like that term, order of magnitude. So they should have similar uh, effects on you. Uh, although again, it depends on the size of the cola 
Um, and I think uh, I've heard that Mountain Dew has a little bit of more caffeine than say Coke, but, or Pepsi. Um, anyway, so yeah, I would say Google it. The, the answers, like, that's what's great about this. This whole week, by the way, is you go to a presentation and you come away with more questions than you had coming in. Again, hopefully some of them are answered, but as st like all of us as STEM educators and STEM students, we want the tools to investigate things. And that's, and so, and fortunately with the internet out there, there's so much information out there. And in effect, what we need to be able to do as STEM um, uh, people is actually draw the connections and make the intelligent connections between things and if we can't make it a connection, let's say that too. So anyway, good question. All of these have been great questions and I really appreciate them. Um, a quick search of Google revealed that 12 ounces of coffee have way more caffeine than Coke and that Diet Coke actually has more caffeine than Coke. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and you. two quick questions before we, and I think that's all we have time for today. Uh, does coffee have the same amount of caffeine as tea? Again, tea varies widely. There's black tea and um, green tea, and I think white tea now I've seen. Um, so again, I, I would defer to uh, Googling it. I'm sure you could find that. Uh, but again, there's a range of values that I know. And finally, is coffee a good source of antioxidants for the human body? The short answer is yes. And there's a whole body of research that I, I didn't get into today, but I started to see on antioxidants in coffee as well. And a lot of chemistry involved in that as well it was for sussing out which of the um, antioxidants are in there using chemical techniques. So I think that's a great question. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is uh, go out there and find these articles and uh, primary and secondary sources and you'll find a lot of information about it. All right, uh, well, I think that's, we're almost out of time, although it would be fun to keep going. Um, but I'd uh, like to remind everyone um, that we have, I just posted the link to the survey. So don't forget to um, take that survey and uh, enter to, uh, you know, for a chance to win a gift card. And I also want to thank you, uh, Bill, for a very um, most excellent and informative presentation. And also thank you to the STEM Week team for making this such a fun week for us all. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you to all the audience for such a nice spirited discussion as well. That's awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Looks like we got a good group in here, so that's exciting. Everyone, I'm just waiting for um, the tech support if they want to close or if I should go ahead and close the session. Thank you so much. This was very fascinating, Bill. Oh, no, Harika, thanks for having me do it. And thank you, Maya, again for uh, uh, leading the session. I really appreciate yeah, it. You did you, a great Maya. job. Oh, happy to. I'm going to have to do this again next year. Um, should I just go ahead and- Go ahead and close it out, Naharika. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we all can get out. I just want to make sure that recording is not. Um, yes, I will end the recording um, right now. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Recording stop.